Let's talk about grooming your horse through the seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. There's a lot of different challenging things in the grooming and healthcare world that happen during those seasons, but there's also some common elements that you should practice and create nice positive habits about so that you can track your horse's health over time. And these daily habits really boil down to how much have you memorized your horse? How much have you memorized their bodies and their habits and their tendencies to eat and drink and pass manure and things like that? When we have our horses memorized, we can better notice when something is wrong and then we can get them the attention that they need. Staying ahead of any health concerns. And it really is that simple knowing your horse's normals and what to do if something is amiss. And obviously your vet's gonna be a great source of information and support, but your job is to memorize your horse and notice when things are different from the day before. The first place I start when I'm doing my daily health checks on my horse, before I even pick up a grooming tool, is to check the temperature, pulse, respirations, TPR as they're known. But I'm also gonna check my horse's gums and his digital pulse. That's the pulse that measures what's going on inside the hoof. And it's important to remember that when you're taking your horse's vital signs, ideally it's done when your horse is at rest because if they've been running around in the field or they've just come in from exercise, their temperature is gonna be elevated, there's gonna be an increase in their heart rate and their respiratory rates and things like that. So if you can get your horse when they're nice and chill and calm, that is the time to take their vital signs. You might also want to track them in the morning and the afternoon to see if anything changes with those normal values that your horse has. Now I have two different types of thermometers. This is a non-mercury shakedown thermometer where you have to literally shake it and then the guide will start to trickle down and then you can take your horse's temperature or a digital thermometer where you just press a button. These are both really good things to have at the barn and you need to have a backup just in case the battery on this one stops working. I also always use a little bit of lubrication or petroleum jelly so that everything's much more comfortable for my horse. And when you're taking your horse's temperature, you want to stand to their side and you want to be able to move their tail so that you can reach in there and put your thermometer right inside the anus. And that is where the poop comes out. And sometimes also a fart. But hold that there until your thermometer beeps or it's been a couple of minutes if you're using the shakedown variety. And then you can take your reading. Everything looks good. Oris's normal body temperature is 99 to about 101. Now let's check your horse's respiratory rates. So I like to look at their flanks and every time their flank inflates and deflates, that is one breath. And for a horse, they normally take between 10 and 24 breaths per minute at rest. So there's not a lot of stuff going on here. And the best way to do it is to have a little stopwatch either on your watch or on your phone where you can just set the timer for 30 seconds, count how many inhales and exhales. You can actually feel your hands moving up and down and then multiply that by two to get breaths per minute. You don't want to check your horse's respiratory rate at their nose because even though you can feel the air moving in and out, they're going to be tempted to smell your hand to see if there's a treat in there. And that's going to change the respiratory rate and not give you an accurate reading. So take a peek at the flank. That's your best chance of getting a good reading. Now to check your horse's pulse rate, that's his heartbeats per minute. You can do two things. You can use a stethoscope behind their left elbow. I think it's a little tricky to find and listen to that heartbeat. So I like to use the maxillary artery, and this is on the other side of their cheek, and you can just kind of run your hands down here until you feel what feels like a chord or a string or maybe a guitar string. Press about halfway down. That's the artery that you can measure the pulse rate from. Grab your timer, your phone, or your watch, set it to 30 seconds, count how many beats, multiply by two, and that is your horse's resting heart rate. And a good pulse rate to have on your horse is somewhere between like 24 and 48 beats per minute. If your 
horse is at rest, and you know he's been at rest for a while, but he has an elevated temperature or elevated respiratory rate or elevated pulse rate, those are all indications that something is going on. An elevated temperature could be a fever, like he's caught a virus or he's fighting an infection. An elevated pulse rate or an elevated breathing rate means that they are uncomfortable somewhere. And you have some exploring to do to see how your horse is feeling overall in his body. I'm also going to inspect my horse's gums because gums can tell you a lot about their circulatory system and also how hydrated they are. So the first thing I do is I take a peek to make sure that the gums are still a nice, healthy pink color. Everything looks good in the color department. Now I'm going to use two fingers and I'm gonna run them between his upper lip and his teeth. Good boy. And I'm just making sure that everything is very slippery. If the gums are sticky, or if they're dry, that means your horse is dehydrated. Any abnormal colors means that there's something else going on with your horse. So if you find the gums are bright pink or red or purple or blue, talk to your vet and you guys can do some troubleshooting together to make sure your horse gets feeling better soon. I'm also gonna check my horse's digital pulse in all four legs. Now this is the measurement of kind of what's going on inside the hoof. And normally a horse's digital pulse is very hard to find. And if you do find it, maybe it's very, very subtle or mild and you can almost barely feel it. If there's something going on inside the hoof, like they have an abscess or a bruise or maybe laminitis is brewing, all of that swollen tissue, which is contained by the hoof capsule, is gonna restrict the blood flow in and out of the hoof. When that happens, that digital pulse is gonna to start to be a lot stronger. You might hear some vets calling it a bounding pulse, and that indicates that there's swelling or something going on inside the hoof. It's actually really easy to find when it's strong, but it's a good idea to know where to find it and check it every single day on your horse. It only takes a few minutes and you can do it on your way to picking their feet. So you start by running your two fingers, your pointer and your middle finger down the tendons along the back of the leg and then under the fetlock. And when you move your finger side to side, you might find what feels like a cord or a guitar string. That's the digital artery. There's also a vein in there, but you're not gonna feel that as easily. Press down about halfway, see if you feel anything. Then repeat on all four legs. You've just completed the health check, checking your horse's vital signs, including gums and the digital pulse. When you get really good at it, it becomes such an easy thing to do every single day and it only takes a few minutes from start to finish. Then you can get grooming. And when you start grooming, I like to start by picking their hooves. And I'm looking for a couple of things. I'm making sure that there's no wounds around the coronary band. That's important because the hoof wall actually grows out of the coronary band and big injuries or dramatic injuries in that area can create problems with the overall hoof structure down the road. I'm also making sure that there are not any new or enlarged cracks, either vertical or horizontal. Horizontal cracks sometimes mean that there's been an abscess inside that comes through the coronary band. Oftentimes we call that gravel and that horizontal opening will start to travel down the hoof and grow out. Vertical little cracks and crevices are great opportunities for some bacteria and fungus to get up in there and create white line disease and thrush and all that kind of good stuff. I'm also going to wiggle the shoe back and forth to make sure that it is secure. I'm gonna make sure all the nails are there. And I'm also going to, when I pick the hoof, smell it because thrush and other hoof infections have a very bad odor and you can often smell them before you can see them. There is also the chance that as you're picking the hoof, you're gonna notice some black goopy stuff, especially around the grooves along the frog. And that is often a sign of a thrush infection as well. As I'm grooming and touching my horse, I want to make sure I'm putting pressure everywhere and getting their reaction. I'm also checking to see if I have 
Um, if my horse has any pockets of soreness, is he itchy somewhere? Maybe he's been bitten by a bug. Maybe there's a tick. Is he feeling pretty good around his saddle area? Sometimes horses with improperly fitting saddles will start to get a little tender under there. Everything good with the belly. Same with the larger muscle groups. Make sure everything is nice and healthy and your horse isn't flinching or giving you any signs that they're sore. Sometimes they'll move away from you. Sometimes they'll kind of shudder. Sometimes they'll flinch. All things to notice over time. And then you can make changes to their care and help them feel a little bit better. I'm also gonna go over every single inch of their body with my fingertips. I'm looking for the soreness, but I'm also looking for heat some swelling maybe? Am I finding some insects like ticks? Is there dandruff in the mane and tail? Is there anything going on in the lower leg? Is there swelling there? Are the tendons and ligaments of the lower leg nice and tight and feel the same as the day before? Are there any signs of scratches or pastern dermatitis in the skin? Sometimes they'll feel like little scabs or little insect bites around the pastern and the fetlock area. How's the coronary band? Everything look good there? And check your horse's ears. I'm just looking for any sores, oral plaques, insects, things like that inside and out. I want to take a look at my horse's eyes. Do I notice any new or different or interesting discharge? Is there any cloudiness to the eye or anything that I should be aware of? Right? I'm also going to peek his nostrils, make sure everything looks good there, make sure it has a normal amount of discharge, which usually is not very much at all. I just make sure that everything looks good. You can, you can also check the corners of their mouth for any sores, either from the bit or maybe from a foxtail in the field. Some horses will get sores there uh, from insects as well. I'm also looking for ticks in the mane and the tail around the ears, under the cheeks, in the elbows is a great place for ticks to hang out. When you are grooming underneath your horse's tail and you're feeling that skin under there and looking in between the butt cheeks, sometimes you'll find insects or dry skin or things like that. And sometimes, especially in gray horses, you'll find the start of little tumors or growths. And it's always a good idea to catch those early. And as you're working around the barn, there's a couple other things to pay attention to. These don't take a lot of time, but you wanna check your horse's manure and you wanna make sure it is consistent with it, how it normally looks. Is it too dry or too wet? Are there more piles than normal or fewer piles than normal? Have the locations changed? Are the size of the manure fecal balls different? Same with your horse's urine output. Are they urinating in the same spots that they usually are? Does it look like it's the same volume? And if you happen to catch them urinating, is it the same color as it normally is? The same volume? Is it as foamy as it normally is? Does your horse look like he's uncomfortable trying to urinate? Meaning does he strain or does everything flow freely? And then look at your horse's living environment where they have shavings in their stall or their paddock or their outdoor shed. Are the shavings normally as ruffled as they usually are or are they messier or tidier than they usually are? How much water did your horse drink? It's important to know, especially in the winter, how much water they're drinking. Is their water clean and clear or do you have some chores to do? Now let's talk about grooming challenges throughout the year. In the springtime, probably the biggest challenge is gonna be your horse's shedding coat. Sometimes it takes forever and you can definitely help your horse along with that. The horse's hair life cycle is actually really interesting. They grow and shed their summer and winter coats depending on how many daylight hours their eyes are registering. So, in the winter, sometime around December 21st or so, we have what's called the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year, where we have the fewest amount of daylight hours. After the winter solstice through January, February, March, 
daylight hours start to increase. And somewhere around mid-February, your horse's brain says, I'm seeing a lot more daylight. I have to get ready for summer. And they will start shedding maybe six, seven, eight weeks or so after that winter solstice. And they shed for a couple of weeks and maybe they'll have one big session where they lose a bunch of their hair. Then their new coat comes in. Now in the summer, around June 21st, we have the summer solstice, which is the most daylight hours. And after June's solstice, daylight hours start to diminish and the opposite happens. Your horse's brain, sometime usually around September, says, ah, fewer, day fewer daylight hours means winter is coming. I need to shed my summer coat. Obviously that shed is not as obvious as it is in the, in the spring. And then they'll start to slowly grow that winter coat in. And it takes several weeks, even maybe a month or longer for that winter coat to come in. And when you have these big sheds, it can be pretty easy to help your horse shed out. The first thing to do is to just increase how much you're grooming. Lots of grooming. If you have a horse vacuum, even better, vacuum the hair out. Bathing your horse can help in the spring. That will loosen all of the hair that's ready to come out. It's easy to release and then you can just hose everything away. You can also give your horse a very nice sandy place to roll in the spring because that sand will kind of act like a giant curry comb on the ground and your horse will do a lot of currying on his own. Yes, you have to brush all the sand out, but usually you'll have a nice horse shaped print of hair that's been released on the ground when they're done. And in the spring, if your horse's shedding cycle is not lined up with the temperature where you live, you can always clip them. You can body clip them or you can trace clip them wherever they need help regulating how much they're sweating. If they're uncomfortable because they're still so fuzzy in the spring and it's too warm, definitely clipping them for their health and, and comfort is a good idea. If you're worried about clipping the summer coat that's coming underneath, don't worry about that. If you chop off some of the summer coat that's coming, it does not matter. Everything's gonna smooth out in the end. If your horse is really late to shed out, or he's just not shedding out at all, sometimes that can mean there's a metabolic issue and sometimes it's an eyesight issue where your horse just needs a little bit of extra help from your vet to figure out what's going on and then get them back on track. Another healthcare challenge and grooming challenge in the spring is going to be the spring grass. Winter grass is typically dormant. Many horses don't get a lot of turnout time in the winter to eat pasture because it's muddy or it's snowy and it's icy and the pastures just aren't growing a lot. So in the spring, when everything starts to bloom, sometimes it can happen in a week. And that rich green grass that comes in is really high in sugars and starches. It's also a diet change for your horse because it's brand new. And we wanna be sure that we let our horses slowly acclimate to any changes in their diet. Many horses benefit from using a grazing muzzle on spring grass simply to help them acclimate and slow down the eating process. Now there's nothing cruel about a grazing muzzle and they're designed to help your horse stay healthy, especially if your horse is at higher risk for laminitis or colic. But even a horse that's not high risk for laminitis or colic can benefit from a grazing muzzle because it slows down that incredibly delicious spring grass that they just want to eat so quickly and so much of. And it's important to think about a grazing muzzle as a hay net, a slow feeder that your horse wears. That's it. Let's talk about another grooming challenge in the spring, and that is mud. Hopefully we have some sort of situation on our paddocks where they don't get too muddy and your horse can at least eat from a mat that is free of mud because you don't want your horse eating any of this, you know, gross stuff. I definitely recommend moving your horse's water and slow feeder systems in the outdoor paddocks where mud tends to accumulate to different spaces throughout the season because that discourages a bunch of foot traffic in one area which can create kind of a dip in the earth which tends to get muddier. So keep things moving around. This is also kind of exciting for your horse's brain. But it can also be a really big challenge to keep your horse clean from the mud. 
Sometimes it can also interfere with your horse's horseshoe and that can create a problem where maybe your farrier needs to come out more often than usual. You also don't wanna put sport boots or polo wraps on your horse's legs if they're muddy. They need to be clean and dry. Now, if you're bringing your horse in and he's got really muddy legs and the weather's warm enough, you can rinse them off and then dry them. If the hair is clipped a little bit shorter, this is very helpful for the drying process. If it's too cold to hose those legs off, you can always wait till they're dry and then groom them with a curry comb and a flicker brush to get all of that dirt and mud out of the fetlock area and the cannon bone area. You could also start using fly sheets a little earlier in the, in the springtime, even before the bugs out, because then if they roll around in the mud, at least not all of it's gonna get stuck to them. Summertime. The bugs are out, the sunshine's out, and most of us are probably thinking about going to a horse show, but that presents its own set of grooming challenges. We want our horse, when we enter the show ring, to be the shiniest that they could ever be to really catch the judge's eye. Natural shine on a horse comes from their skin. Their skin produces something called sebum, which is an oil secreted by the sebaceous gland that coats each little piece of hair coming out of their body. And this creates shine, it makes your horse waterproof, and it also helps prevent stains from setting in. And we want to keep as much of that for as long as we can. And some really harsh shampoos will tend to strip that away. When should you bathe your horse before a show? It's really tempting to do it the day before or the morning of the show, but we don't want to strip away any of their natural oils. You could back up a few days and maybe three or four days before the show, bathe your horse and then curry comb until your arms fall off so that you can restore some of that natural shine. You could also use a much milder shampoo closer to your show date that's gonna let that natural sebum, that natural oil on your horse stay there and create shine. I like to use two different shampoos for my horse. Both are really mild. Both will not strip their natural sebum and they actually even enhance shine. One of them is high shine, which is exactly what it says it is. It creates a lot of shine on your horse. Now, if I have a horse that is really sensitive to bugs and insects and his skin needs a little bit of soothing, I'm gonna use a medicated shampoo. This one is Medicare and it has in it tea tree and some lemongrass, very soothing and they also smells really nice. If you would like to condition your horse's coat before the show, which actually adds shine and it makes the hair nice and soft and helps prevent future stains from forming, I recommend oil buffing your horse. This is the number one light oil. This is a grooming oil and it does all of those things, shine, conditioning, and helps prevent stains. In the summertime, it's really easy to oil buff your horse. You can do it lots of different ways. I use a grooming oil and a little bit of water and some rags. I use a small bucket. It's about halfway full. I'm gonna dump in some rags. And then I just pour my grooming oil directly into the bucket. I don't use a whole lot. Then I just swirl everything around. I'll grab a rag. I'll rinse it out. In the winter, I'll do this with hot water and I'll really make an effort to get most of it out. But in the summer and warm weather like this, I'm just gonna wring it out a little bit. And then I just take this cloth and I use it like a curry comb. It helps if your horse is clean when you do this. You could also use a really stiff brush if your horse's hair coat is a little bit longer or you just prefer this. And it's the same thing. Get it a little bit wet with your oil and water and brush it on. Once your horse is ridiculously clean and shiny for the show, let's keep him that way. So one of the things you can do at the show and at home after the bath is you can take all the dirty shavings out of their shed or their stall or wherever they sleep and replace them with nice, fresh, new, clean shavings. You could also put a fly sheet or a sheet on them to protect their bodies when they lay down and sleep. And definitely plan on doing some extra curry comb action and grooming the day of the show. Now let's say you need to spot clean your horse because they rolled in something and they have a big stain on their side or maybe on their cheek or their neck or belly somewhere. You don't have to give your horse an entire bath. You can use a no rinse shampoo like Easy Out. This is a spot treatment. Now 
the awesome thing about Easy Out is that one, it's pretty and it has a lot of these like added sparkles in it. So it adds a little bit of shine to your horse's coat. The other thing is this is a deodorizer, which if your horse smells like the stain, it will remove that as well. If your horse is naturally oily with sebum, the stains are going to naturally lift. Then I use a damp washcloth just to buff it out. If there's any hint of color left, I'm gonna use a little spot remover on a cloth and buff that out. Good as new. I started this cleanup by wiping off what I could with dry rags. I used a lot of dry rags. When I was done with barn chores, he had already dried and that's when I curried off all of the mud and used a stiff brush to flick everything away. This was Virginia red clay and bluestone, so it had multi layers. Yeah. Now I summon the power of three, my no rinse shampoo, my hot water kettle, and a washcloth. I dunk my washcloth in the hot water and I wring it out. Then you can spray either your washcloth or your horse directly and just start buffing away. Sometimes you need to do this a couple of different times with a couple of different cloths until all the stain is lifted. This is great for Palominos, gray horses, white horses, but if you have a dark horse like a bay or a black or a chestnut, they still can sometimes look a little dusty or dull. You could use Easy Out because it's got those lovely sparklies in it to create a little layer of glimmer on your horse as it lifts up any remaining dust that they might have. Another summer challenge is insects and flies and bugs. They are annoying, they can create sores on your horse, they can create itchy welts, they can draw blood, they can transmit disease, and they're just generally annoying to have around. So you wanna be sure that your fly control program attacks the fly life cycle from all angles. You could start with fly predators. These are tiny little wasps. You can order them and they're shipped through the mail and you release them on your property every couple of weeks or so. And these tiny little wasps actually eat the fly larvae that's landed in and around the manure and the paddocks and things like that. So the life cycle is getting broken there. Now you could also go for the adult flies by using like a fly trap or a fly bag but you want to use those away from your horses because you don't wanna lure the flies to your horse. You wanna put them at the edges of your property so they don't even wanna come in. When you're doing your daily chores, clean, clean, clean. Remove all of the urine spots and clean up all the manure from your horse's living areas. That includes their paddocks, that includes their stalls, their outdoor sheds, anywhere where they're going to drop some manure. This also includes in the riding arena. Number one, because flies are attracted to it. But number two, when manure decomposes in the riding ring, it creates a lot of dust, which is not great for anybody's respiratory system. If you have fans that have automatic shutoffs, if they become too hot, those are great to use around the horses because it's hard for a horse to land if the wind is blowing really hard. You can also add fly sprays and fly repellents into your grooming routine, but know that depending on what kind of flies live around your barn, they may or may not be affected by the type of fly spray you use. For example, this is a fly spray that's made out of fatty acids. It smells very funny, but it serves to confuse insects that are attracted by a certain smell. So you're camouflaging your horse by confusing the insects. This is not gonna work against an insect that looks for things to eat like the larger horse flies. They are more visual predators. Your standard fly sprays with the permethrins and the pyrethrins are great. They do have a limited time cycle, so they're not gonna last all day. And against the larger insects, there's just not enough fly spray in the world that's going to kill a really big fly um, a really big horse fly. Now you might be able to knock it down or repel it a little bit, but that's something to consider as you are thinking about how to protect your horse from flies. I'll also always recommend using fly sheets, fly masks, and fly boots, simply because 
they're irritating to horses and they're twitching and they're stomping and they're swinging their tails and it's just really difficult for a horse to be comfortable when they are spending their entire waking moments trying to fend off these flies. And using fly protective products like sheets and masks and boots takes care of that for you. The other reason I really like to use fly boots is that sometimes when horses are irritated by flies on their legs, they'll stomp a lot and that creates a concussion in the leg. It's not comfortable. It can loosen your horse's horseshoes. It can create bruising. And it's just not good for your horse's hoof health to be doing all of that stomping. Another summer grooming challenge is the darker horse, the bay, the chestnut, even sometimes the palomino, where the sun starts to bleach out their coat and it changes a little bit of color. Maybe a bay is going to change into a little bit of a blonde or a black horse might get some red highlights because of the sun. There's a couple of things you can do. One is to make sure your horse's diet is really, really well balanced for their age and their workload and where they live and everything like that. Because the zinc and copper in your horse's diet, when given in the proper amount, not too much and not too little, helps the pigments color your horse's hair. And when that balance is correct, it's less likely to bleach out from the sun. The other thing is your horse's skin and coat needs to be nice and healthy, so keep the sebum on there, don't strip it away. Keep up with good curry comb habits. And then before you turn your horse out into the sun, make sure that they are dry. And if they've been sweating for exercise, make sure you've rinsed the sweat off. Let them dry and then buffed out your horse's coat if there's any residual dryness there. Fly sheets will also provide a layer of UV protection. And if you're behind the curve a little bit and your horse is already bleached out, you could consider using a color correcting shampoo. This is Equitone and it comes in black and red and gold and whitening. And it's designed to deposit color onto your horse to make up for that bleaching. You apply this like a regular shampoo, wait five or 10 minutes, and then you can rinse it out. And now we're into fall, which brings another set of grooming considerations to have. The first thing being your horse's footwear, his shoes. Do you pull your horse's shoes for cold weather? In some places it's customary to do this, but think about your horse's hoof before you decide to do that. Are they thin soled? Are they tender footed after a shoe? Are their hooves healthy enough where they're not gonna chip away? And then what kind of footing would your horse live on in the winter time without a horseshoe? Is it hard and rocky? Is it possibly frozen? In which case you definitely want to have some sort of hoof protection on there. And then you and your vet and your farrier can decide if pulling those shoes is a good idea. And then we have the case of the sweaty horse because in the fall, as their hair starts to come in for their winter coat, if they're still being ridden or the temperatures are still warm in your area, they might start sweating under that winter coat that's coming in. And it may or may not be a problem depending on how much sweat there is. And we wanna think about this because when a horse is out in the rain, they're going to get wet, but that water is coming from outside and laying on the top of their coat. But sweat comes from their skin, so it comes under the coat and gets trapped. And if there's bacteria on the skin, there's a lot of moisture and dampness, and that can create the perfect situation for a skin problem like rain rot, which is a bacterial infection. Horses that are very sweaty in the winter, especially when you're riding them, have a harder time regulating their body temperature. For example, when they're being ridden and they have a nice thick woolly coat and they sweat a lot, they might have a tendency to become a little bit overheated or the risk of becoming overheated is greater. They also spend more energy to thermoregulate when they're furry and sweating because they have to cool themselves off and they have to produce all of that sweat, which takes a lot of energy. And then you have a wet horse in the winter time and when you're done riding, you're gonna come back to the barn and he's gonna take a long time to dry, which is, cannot be a big deal at all. You can use coolers, you can take your horse for an extra long walk out, but you wanna be sure the return to his normal body temperature is nice and steady and he doesn't get chilled. In the fall, if the sweaty horse situation is something that you deal with, you could always consider clipping. Now you don't have to clip 
any specific style of clip. You just have to clip where your horse sweats. If they look like Swiss cheese when you're done clipping, that's totally fine. You're doing it for their health and their comfort. Now, you can also clip at different times during the season. If you clip early, like when they're still actively growing in their coats, maybe around October, late September, early October, a lot of the coat's still gonna come in and by the time the cold weather gets here in January, they'll have a layer of fuzz. But if you want them to be really, really naked because you live in South Florida or South Texas or Arizona, you could clip it any time in the fall and keep clipping to keep that hair short and to keep your horse comfortable. And now we're into winter. One of the biggest challenges in winter, depending on where you live, might be the ground and any snow. So if you live in an area that gets snow, either occasionally or all the time, you remember what it's like for a horse to walk around with giant snowballs on his hooves. There's a couple of things that we can do to help prevent that. And we want to prevent that so that their hoof is nice and flat and balanced on the earth. When they're on this little snowball, everything gets wiggly and there's a chance of injury. You could coat the hooves with a grooming oil that hopefully will protect some of the snow from packing into that hoof. You can also have your farrier put in snow pads, which is a special kind of rubbery pad that goes under the horseshoe and covers most of the bottom of the hoof. This prevents snowballs from happening. And then maybe think about altering your turnout schedules or where you turn your horse out if there is snow on the ground. You'll always want to be sure if your horse goes out in a paddock or you're riding with snow on the ground that there's not a layer of ice underneath or that the snow is thick enough where any frozen ground could be a potential hazard. When you think about what happens when the ground freezes, any unevenness in the ground, including like rocks and gravel and things like that, are going to be frozen in place and your horse could trip over them or he could land right onto something pointy and create a hoof bruise. So knowing what's under the snow is just as important as knowing how much snow there is. And let's think about your horse's leg hair in the winter. As a horse's winter coat grows in, it starts to get really fluffy around the, the fetlock and the pasture and the lower leg area. And this is for many reasons. One, it helps the water drain down and two, it keeps your horse's legs warm, which is always nice. But if there's a lot of mud, if there's a lot of moisture, if your horse's legs and their feathers are getting really, really wet, you might want to consider taking down some of the hair. You don't have to take down all of it. You can rake down with your clippers to remove some of the hair. That creates um, a situation where it's easier for your horse to dry. And we want to do this so that we don't get that trap of moisture and bacteria and stuff from the shavings and the mud all stuck on the skin, creating a possible skin infection like scratches or pastern dermatitis. Another part of caring for your horse in the winter is noticing if their long winter coat is creating any sores or mats anywhere. When the coat is really long and they wear tack like saddles and girths and bridles and things like that, that long winter coat can get trapped under the hair and then as your horse moves, creates a little bit of friction. You can actually create lots of tangles in the hair that create mats up against the skin. You might also see some areas of hair loss, which can easily turn into an open sore if allowed to continue. So as you're getting your horse ready to ride and after you come back from the barn, make sure to inspect with your eyes and your fingertips all around your horse where there was any piece of tack touching him, paying particular attention to the elbows because there's a lot of loose skin in there. Pay attention to the pole behind the ears and pay attention to the withers and the top line of your horse where the saddle sits. You can certainly clip those areas. You can also clip them down a little bit. You don't have to clip all the way by using a clipper comb. This leaves a little bit of the hair on the top or you could just take a little vacation, let your horse heal for a little bit and then you can start riding again. Remember that your horse's grooming routine is actually their healthcare routine. And when you start adding in their vital signs and their daily health checks, you'll start to notice when something is different than it was the day before and you can stay ahead of any problems. Your horse will appreciate it 
and it creates a lot of opportunities for creating that nice relationship between you and your horse.